Hi, Cece. Well, hello, Jim. How are you? I'm good. I mean, we've literally been together like for three whole days straight. Well, why is that? Oh, because it is Chuseok weekend. Absolutely right. It's the, mm-hmm. um, I guess, the Harvest Festival for yeah. people who aren't in Korea. Yeah. And, you know, I always say this is a great time to be in Seoul because a lot of people leave Seoul. Yeah, except go. this time it seems like but they're then, not really leaving. No, because I think we live in an area oh, yeah. where, where everybody a lot goes, of old people. The old people. Yeah, so like a lot of people come here because yeah. their parents live here, I think. And so it's been a jam-packed, like the the parking lots are jam-packed. Lots of kids everywhere. Mm-hmm. Lots of old people with their grandchildren. Mm-hmm. It's just like, it's been kind of chaotic. And I'm like, now I'm like, okay, maybe we should go somewhere next yeah, time. Yeah. And we really haven't gone beyond our neighborhood. We thought we were going to like, woo, so Yeah, I know. Yeah. But um, we also have a dog now. I know. So. Yeah. Yeah. Nice relaxing weekend. It was a very relaxing weekend, though. I was strangely productive, I think mm-hmm. you were too. I, yeah, I yeah. always try to be productive. Yeah, and you're working on stuff. Yeah, I have new so stuff that I'm you working You haven't on. really taken any time off. No. Because for me, it's like I have a weekend weekend where I absolutely take time off. but And I've been productive with my projects. Mm-hmm. But you are just working all the time. I think that's the trap with like freelance work. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. But you know, actually, I'm I'm I feel like I'm doing a good job since I've taken on this new book project I'm working uh-huh. on of actually letting it go during the weekends because I'm on the clock. Oh, that's so, right. So because I'm yeah. on the clock, I can let it go, even though I'm still thinking about well, it. Good, yeah. But on the weekend now, I'm just like reading, and I need there's a bunch of reading I need to catch up on. So I'm reading Philip K. Dick and Ursula but K. That, Le Guin. Yeah, and, but you were also you're also doing a lot of research and reading for the book. This, this project, is for the book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. yeah. And it's uh yeah, it's Sunday night here and mm-hmm. so the weekend's coming to a close. Although I think people have Monday off most people. Yeah, so right? tomorrow's um the last day of Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like Thanksgiving for people who live yes. in the States. It is a lot like Thanksgiving, yeah. except so that we didn't colonize anybody. No, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody in Korea, there was nobody we didn't here to any give genocide. any turkeys to anybody. No. We didn't trick yeah, the indigenous people. Distinctly into- American. Yeah. <laughs> tradition of taking all, it out there. taking everything putting, of your in yeah. your land and then yeah. saying thanks yeah. for giving all I of that. I just needed stuff. to just needed to, you know, clarify. Yeah, for people who are curious that yeah. the Chusok is the is the harvest. It's the mm-hmm. rice harvest. Mm-hmm. And we celebrated the rice harvest by eating a bunch of bread. Mm-hmm. I know, right? Well, it's probably because I don't really like traditional Chuseok food. I love Seollal food, mm-hmm. which we had. Yeah. The New Year's food. But I don't like Chuseok food because it's a lot of like rice. What movie did we see? We watched Singles 1992 by Cameron Crowe. Mm-hmm. And we-, we thought you were very insistent that it was a movie about music, but we found out that it's not really a movie about music. Yeah. I mean, it could be. I mean, it is, it is, it's a, it's a, you said it. Yeah. I, like I was thinking, oh, maybe this is a movie about play, a, a place. Mm-hmm. And because we're, you know, planning on transitioning into this more general movies about kind of theme. But then I realized I didn't have anything to say about Seattle. You said it. Right. You said it's it's not a movie about music. It's not a movie about a place. It's a movie about... A time. A time, an era, a period of time, mm-hmm. which is 1992 in Seattle. Right. And the way their lives are wrapped up in music. Yeah, it's kind of totally. about the It's kind of about the single's existence, but very particular to its time. Totally, yeah. I wonder if that was intentional in any way, but they couldn't have known that, right? It was just... Well, a... yeah, it was kind of like, you know, I went through this time and mm-hmm. I was, you know, one of these types of people. I guess mm-hmm. I was, how old was I then? I was 23. Mm-hmm. And... I feel like you were exactly one of these types of people. I was exactly one yeah. of these types of people, yeah. And I was living, you know, I was living with my college roommates. Oh, the bacon throwing house? People, yeah, the bacon throwing people. Okay, with the beer mountain the beer can the, mountain we had a beer can well we had what we had was so we had this house in east san jose and we we drank so much natural light beer mm-hmm. which is the cheapest beer you could get you could get a, a case of it so 24 mm-hmm. beers for 399 so we would drink so much of this beer and we didn't know what to do with all the empties. So we would stack them outside of our window mm. like a wall. This horrifying yeah. stack of empties. Yeah. Dead soldiers, as we used to call them. It's a horrifying... Yeah. And that was 1992 for me. Cool. So, yeah. yeah. And you were also playing a lot of drums, right? I was playing drums, yeah. yeah. I was playing in a... I think I was... Yeah, I was playing in a in a cover band called Candy Graham for Mongo, mm. which is a... There's a Saturday Night Live skit called mm-hmm. Landshark. Mm. And, you know, he this guy would knock on the door and he would say, Candygram for Mongo. 
and he's trying to get the woman to open the door because he's actually a land shark and he would eat her. That was the bit. Oh, I feel like I've this I've heard of this. Yeah. yeah. So he would say yeah. that he's all these other yeah, things. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah. Just to get her to open the door. Yeah, yeah. And so the band was called I, I joined them late. I, I was in a band called Ballyhoo mm-hmm. and we were like kinda like this. We were kind of like nineteen ninety ninety one. You know, you had the hair metal bands and then you had this transition into grunge. Mm-hmm. So you had this transition period going on where, mm-hmm. you know, there was Queensryche mm-hmm. and there was, you know, bands like Poison, who I never was into, and Warrant, who I was never into. I was never into these bands. But what was happening was like 89, you had Jane's Addiction coming up. They were from LA. They weren't from Seattle. But they started, you started going, oh, they're weird and they don't care. They're They're like not doing the typical I want to have sex with you song Mm. you know and they were arty and they were Mm. very Los Angeles and they looked like heroin junkies Mm. and in 1990 89 90 that was a great thing so there was this transition period and my band Ballyhoo that I was in we were kind of in that transition period Mm. we were making kind of grunge music that was still kind of hair metal Mm -hmm. music so heavy riffs Mm. and um, you know big open chords and you know everybody had long hair but it was okay if you had short hair Mm -hmm. you know kind of thing but yeah and then I the bass player in that band, his name is Brian, Brian McSherry. He said, I'm joining this other band. And I was like, no, man, I'm loyal to this band. You know, we're going to make it. I could totally see. So. Yeah. And and um, he said, well, I'm going to leave. I'm, I'm, I'm done. And there was this big cover band scene that was going mm-hmm. on in San Jose at the time when I was living in San Jose, California. So eventually I thought, he's like, oh, but we're making like a, a hundred bucks a night. Or 150 bucks a night. And I'm like, oh shit, really? Mm -hmm. I could quit my job at the movie theater. Mm -hmm. And so I joined the band and we just played everywhere in San Jose and we became one of the big cover bands and we'd really pack pack the clubs. And so that took me out of having an actual Mm -hmm. job and being able to make money playing Mm -hmm. music. Mm -hmm. So I did that for a few years, but it was just a great time. Cool. Yeah. So that's what I was doing. During mm-hmm. 1990, 91, 92. Cool. Yeah. And this movie, we haven't said a thing about this movie yet, have we? Right. So blathering. you just read the Wikipedia description. It was like yeah. one sentence. Can you read that again? Oh, sure. Singles centers on the precarious romantic lives of a group of young Gen Xers in Seattle, Washington, at the height of the 1990s grunge phenomenon. Yeah, that's exactly what this movie is about. Like, yes. there's nothing more or less to that. And then the, the, there are a lot of cameos, though. Like a lot of um, bands, yeah. right? Featured in the movie as actors, yeah, but also themselves. It was really interesting. Eddie Vedder is the drummer of the band Citizen Dick, which mm-hmm. Matt Damon is. No, Matt Dillon. Matt Dillon. Mm-hmm. Matt Dillon is the singer mm-hmm. of Citizen Dick, mm-hmm. and Jeff Amet and Stone Gossard, I think, are the bass player and guitar player mm-hmm. in the band. So it's Pearl Jam, right? Except with Eddie Vedder as the drummer, and then Chris Cornell shows up at one point yeah. randomly, and. You've got Bill Pullman. Uh huh. You've got, and there are different bands who are playing, like in the yeah. So Allison Chains does yeah. two songs. Mm-hmm. Um, they do Wood, mm-hmm. and they do mm, I can't remember the name of the other one. Soundgarden plays live. Right. There's no live. Obvious Pearl Jam couldn't play a song because they're characters in the film. <laughs> um, but yeah, the whole idea is there's this band called Citizen Dick, mm-hmm. which is a very not a very grunge name, actually. Right. It's a little too... That's what I mean by this bridging between yeah. the 80s and the 90s. Yeah. It's still got this penis mentality that was the 80s that right. would kind of die out with grunge. Well, there was um, there's this podcast that I listen to every week. Like I religiously listen to this podcast while I'm cleaning, usually. And it's called Everything is Fine. And it's a podcast for women over 30, 40. Oh, you you yeah. forwarded one to me once. And um, one of the hosts, Kim France, was the editor and founder of Sassy Magazine, which is like a legendary mm. teen magazine from the 90s. Very short-lived. Mm-hmm. And she was also the editor of Lucky Magazine. If you're a girl, you this means something to you. Mm-hmm. But anyway, she was talking about when the 90s truly started and it was like 1994 for her oh interesting because that's right about when it died for me yeah so she was talking about like the true 90s and then it didn't end until like the early 2000s but i think she was but she's not in music 
Right. So I right. sort of see it the opposite. Mm-hmm. I see the 90s as actually starting in 89. Because again, for me, Jane's Addiction pulled me into mm-hmm. that. Jane's Addiction, it wasn't Nirvana that opened my world. We can talk about Nirvana later if we want. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't Nirvana that opened my world. It was Jane's Addiction. Mm-hmm. And to me, they were the gateway. It was oh, like, I, I said, holy shit. Because I heard this song. This was actually on their second album, mm-hmm. uh, Ritual De Lo Habitual, it's called. And on MTV, we got everything from MTV then. And I would stay up late and watch 120 minutes, mm-hmm. postmodern MTV, these shows that were on late at night. And I saw Jane's Addiction. It was a song called Stop. Mm-hmm. And it's the first song on Ritual De Lo Habitual. And I, my mind exploded. Mm. It's such a great mm. song. And it's like, I'd never heard anything like that before right. in my life. And then came Smashing Pumpkins, which is interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting. And then... Alice in Chains. Right. And then Nirvana hit. But before oh. this, the Seattleites are going to kill me. Mm-hmm. Soundgarden was doing this. And other bands were doing this. Mother Love Bone and I think Mud Honey and these different mm-hmm. bands. These Seattle bands were making their way up. Of course, we didn't know because nobody had broke. Mm-hmm. I could only get what had broken, mm-hmm. right? Because I didn't live in Seattle. But so this period of time, and mm-hmm. it's interesting that Cameron Crowe hit on it right as it was happening. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like 92 yeah. is right in the middle of it. Mm-hmm. And for me, this is the one of the greatest times mm-hmm. in music history. Mm-hmm. Like I think of the 70s were a great time. Mm-hmm. Obviously, the 60s were a great time. But I I bookend this magical time of music that Mm -hmm. I think of as the 90s from The Cure's Disintegration Mm -hmm. album in 1989 to Kurt Cobain killing himself. Okay. And then after that, it sort of died out. Yeah, that's fair. But then this this woman's perspective uh, is probably coming from a different place. A fashion perspective. Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fashion and contemporary art perspective, I think. But yeah, it was very interesting. For me, I, you know, I was too young to remember any of it. But I do love the sound, that grunge sound. Mm. And it's a very particular sound and an instrumentation. And also some sort of like, there's this SM58 like microphone mm. kind of sound. Mm. I don't know if they actually used sm 50 No, I know but, exactly what you're saying. Yeah, That's a good this, way of, of putting it. Yeah, there's this... Um, raw, raw, raw kind rawness. of direct yeah, sound. Yeah, definitely yep. with the amplifiers, mm-hmm. like, you know. And for me, the sound is defined by... Like the drums kind of being the pulse of the whole thing. Mm. The drums and the vocals being sort of like the columns of mm. the music, but mm-hmm. also the the bass and the guitars sort of live, like just kind of turn on the the songs. And yeah, there's it's very al- electric. Yeah, it's and there's always energetic. a point where this electric gu- guitar comes in and just sort of gets everybody crazy there's this electric guitar like you know like mm-hmm. sound and i used to like that when i was mm. a preteen. yeah i don't know if i would like feel the same way about that now as like a middle-aged woman <laughs> yeah. but i used to really like it because it was like you know my introduction into rock music because mm. i was so young like i was nine in 1992 mm. and um So that was, it's a very early memory kind of thing for me because like me, I was born in the 80s and imagine like I was listening to this lame ass music, right? Yeah. During my childhood, Mm -hmm. it was like, you know, fucking Vanilla Ice and, you know, MC Hammer or whatever. That's right. (laughs) And then... All of a sudden, I was introduced, the mainstream, you know, uh, in mainstream mainstream music introduced grunge. And so that just, it was for us, it was just like, I couldn't wait to grow up to be part of Mm -hmm, that. mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And even the fashion to me was just so cool. There's something so incredibly practical and laid back about grunge fashion yeah that is also not sloppy it was before we had words like hipster and indie yeah it was just such something that you know you you just kind of i don't know and and people you know we've been trying to recreate that but i don't think that it's kind of it it never kind of went back to that yeah now it would be retro but you can't fully do it you can't fully do it there was the the, you know it's just the coziest sweaters and Mm -hmm. like doc martens it just made sense at the time and simple clothes it was like simple striped shirts yeah and yeah it was a lot of flannel because in seattle it's mm-hmm. kind of cold exactly it makes so much sense yeah yeah hiking and boots there's something blue jeans. It's, yeah there's something so romantic about it mm. now that i think of it mm. and i i really enjoyed this movie actually so bridget fonda is one of the mm-hmm. stars in this movie and 
Cece and I have differing opinions on that, and we can talk about that. Right. But you liked her her fashion, and I did too. Yeah. Um, she had that. She, she had a really cute black hat on mm-hmm. at one point totally. that went with her. I don't know what she was wearing. It was like a dress. Yeah, like a dress that was like kinda, a mustard colored dress yeah, or something. Like a. But it had a like a black t-shirt underneath it or something no 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 No? she did it was actually really low cut Mm -hmm. and she had a lot of necklaces on oh yeah that was another thing and she's also she was very skinny so Mm -hmm. there was like and that was the height of like heroin chic right like you had to be really skinny yeah well it was the height of like people were literally dying of heroin like the the, i mentioned the band mother love bone who you hear Mm -hmm. in this movie that's the band out of which pearl jam came Mm -hmm. because the lead singer andrew wood i think is his name Mm -hmm. overdosed on heroin Mm -hmm. and he was one of the first so he was like Seattle. He's like Seattle legend, mm-hmm. and heroin was a real thing. Mm-hmm. Like it, was, it, it really took off, and it became so fashionable. Yeah, it's fucked up. Yeah, but it's yeah, a it's, product of the the time, I guess. Yeah, I guess so. Mm-hmm. It's a time when before cell phones, mm-hmm. so we had to call people, and we had answering machines mm-hmm. with little tiny micro cassette tapes. Mm-hmm. And in this movie. One of the tapes fails, mm-hmm. although she doesn't seem to understand how to fix it, which mm-hmm. is funny. Mm-hmm. But it creates a conflict, so you uh, know, yeah, whatever. exactly, exactly. Um, the movie itself was like it was okay. Like you know, the dialogue was funny at times. It was it had this pace that I recognize from certain '90s movies about Gen Xers, mm-hmm. young Gen Xers. Like mm-hmm. Reality Bites was one of those movies. Yeah, I know you don't like Reality Bites, mm-hmm. but it has the same sort of vibe yeah. and pace. And there was there were references, you know, there there was a, a, a certain rhythm to the dialogue that was very pertinent to the nineties. Mm. Um and just people kind of were not as sarcastic as mm. they were like my generation was, but it was getting there. Like I could see it was the precursor of the hipster generation that my generation had you know, because we were all about like this stupid irony and like mm-hmm. being emo and weird and mm-hmm. being edgy, right? Then that's where the hipster came from. Okay, and that's why where why people hate us so much because mm. we were so pretentious. But this was actually like they were pretty authentic about it. There was nothing really forced. It didn't feel contrived, but think, they were still very edgy and like right. I think yeah. being silent wasn't was attractive. Oh, in in that okay. period of time, yeah. so kind of holding back and being reserved. Yeah. It was a certain type of cool. And it was and not kind trying of, too hard. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think that was it maybe I, I was watching this and I was like, maybe my generation was trying to like imitate, you know, what we had seen from the Gen Xers, but, but like failing tragically. Yeah, I don't know. I I, I wonder. Um yeah. at that point I was when the millennials started um kind of taking over you know like i said for me when kurt cobain died nothing was the same Mm -hmm. and i started listening to other types of music actually started listening to a lot of instrumental music and Mm -hmm. and strange jazz and strange classical Mm -hmm. music and dub i was listening to a lot of dub reggae music because by then to me it was gone but like the next generation that came in i was still playing music in bars and stuff like that so we would Mm -hmm. play what was what was happening but that's also when hip-hop started becoming big and I didn't listen to hip hop. Mm-hmm. So I kind of fell out. Yeah, I, I, I could see what you're talking and about. And the fashion, I didn't really, I stayed the same. Yeah, you stayed the same. And then like the world kind of swung back to, <laughs> you know, what you were, you're, you've been wearing this whole time. Uh-huh. I think like it, it kind of did a full circle. Yeah, right? my thing was always like, I liked, I didn't surf, mm-hmm. but I liked surfing clothes mm-hmm. because I liked the shirts and I liked the shorts mm-hmm. and rock climbing clothes. I did rock climb. Mm-hmm. I used to rock climb. And so I liked rock climbing type clothes. So I, I like surfing clothes sense. and rock yeah. climbing clothes. Makes sense. Yeah. Outdoors guy. Mm-hmm. And that was an element of uh, grunge mm-hmm. because it was very, yeah, it was like hiking boots and stuff mm-hmm. like that. But then in this movie, it's interesting. You um, you get as the leads, these two kind of, one's an environmentalist and she's mm-hmm. played by Kira Sedgwick mm-hmm. and Scott Campbell. Is that his name? Campbell Scott. I'm sorry. Who to me is kind of a cross between... Eric Bana, I would say. Oh, Eric Bana. Mm-hmm. And... Toby McGuire. Oh my God. I had two different people in okay. mind. I was going to say, what's his name from Say Anything? Oh, John Cusack. Yeah. So it, it, he was a cross between John Cusack, but not with, but without the personality okay. and Kyle MacLachlan oh. from Twin Peaks. Okay. It's odd to me that these, these were the main characters mm-hmm. rather than say Matt Damon and Bridget Fonda. Matt Dillon, baby. Matt Dillon. Yeah. And Bridget Fonda, who were the, I thought the more interesting. They were. And maybe that's why they were marginal characters because like. Yeah. But I like it. They're not relatable. Yeah. But it was this interesting crossover. I think Mm -hmm. that when Cameron Crowe wrote it, 
I think he was thinking of this crossover because mm-hmm. it's kind of like a movie like About Last Night. I don't know if you saw that, but it's... Um, mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's about couples. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so they need, they're need they kind of the normal mm-hmm. people. And then Bridget Fonda and Matt Dillon's Dillon. character are the new type. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I'm saying? So, oh, no, I know what you're saying. So they're yeah. kind of like the standard couple. Uh-huh. So it's this crossover, again, right. that's happening in the early 90s yeah. where it's still the old kind of way of doing things. I don't know. I just thought of that yeah. just now. But um, but I there's something about Kira Sedgwick that really bothers me. Mm, what is it? Is it her teeth? <laughs> there's something going on with her mouth. Yeah, I um, agree. And her sincerity mm-hmm. doesn't ring sincere to me. Well, I feel like Campbell Scott or whatever, whoever that him was, too. like him too. So yeah. I may, maybe that so was intentional. But I did say something to you when I was watching the whole thing, and I remembered something. And this has been talked about a lot mm-hmm. in other, you know, it's been the papers have been written about this. But I remember, I suddenly remember that in the nineties, there was like just if you were blonde, you were an ingenue. Uh, if you're blonde, you're hot. Mm-hmm. Even if you're not. Mm-hmm. So Kira Sedgwick, for me, is not an attractive woman, but she's a blonde mm-hmm. white woman. Right. And so automatically she's at this top tier yeah. of the dating game. Right. And this was very true. She has great movies. hair. She has, yeah. You said Julia Roberts. She kind of has Julia Roberts hair. She's an unattractive Julia Roberts, like to me. Like, she looks I think she's like married a, to Kevin Bacon. Yeah, I mean, but, you know, I, nothing against this right. actress. Obviously, like, I feel really bad that I'm, like, calling somebody unattractive. But, eh, like, it's a podcast. For me, like... It just doesn't ring like I I have a hard time believing that this is this like very attractive, like very desirable woman. Right. Um, But I remembered something that somebody said in another podcast that, you know, for a really long time, brunettes were like kind of a second tier. Mm. Like you you were never like the main character girl. This is interesting because I think this is part of the crossover because in Mm. my time during the 90s, Mm. brunettes were more attractive. But I remember in the 80s, the blondes were attracted. So it's interesting you say that because I think that's exactly this crossover. And then there was like... Winona Ryder. And yeah, then so like, there you yeah, go. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. But there was this time, I remember like a blonde was like the be all, like mm-hmm, the end all mm-hmm. to everything. And I was like, oh, that's a interesting cultural, like yeah. it's from a certain era. You right, know? right. And, and still, like, I think like in the 2000s, brunettes were you know, appreciated, but then also like it was still like the white woman. I think archetype. blondes came back, didn't they? Blondes definitely came yeah. back, but blondes will ever. I mean, I you know, blondes are great, but whatever. Yeah, but, but in like, the nineties, like we again, I think there was a, there was a down to earth kind of right. There was also in the nineties. I think people don't realize this or remember this, but there was a there was a big hippie element. There was mm. a neo hippie kind mm-hmm. of element. You know, there's a lot of jam bands happening. Mm-hmm. Also, like Spin Doctors and Fish, mm-hmm. Dave Matthews Band. Who was the other? A uh, blues traveler bands like. Mm-hmm. this and so there was kind of a, an earthy rootsy let's go camping mm-hmm. and the brunettes were just kind of like that and we were reading mm-hmm. ken kesey and um tom robbins and stuff like that well also there are some beautiful brunettes like just yeah, undeniably yeah, yeah. like just so much more beautiful than the blondes out there exactly kind of brunettes. Yeah. and so it was undeniable like mm-hmm. you know it just like you take like 90s Angelina Jolie and put her next to any blonde Mm -hmm. and she's just the most striking, you know, whatever. But anyway, all that aside, Mm -hmm. there was this, you know, representation of this very basic woman in this character that was kind of like, yeah, okay. Well, I didn't, I didn't believe their characters are Linda and Steve, (laughs) which is our, my my sister sister and her husband. husband. (laughs) But they didn't strike me as people who would go out to see Alice in Chains. Right. Me neither. Yeah. Me neither. Apparently those, like the footage of those concerts Uh was spot on accurate. Uh, But then it's almost like you dropped in. Uh Uh-huh. These basic uh, ass people. Campbell Scott yeah. and Kira Sedgwick. Yeah. Yeah. These basic people. These really basic people. Who seem like they're from, I don't know. Minnesota. Yeah. I was yeah. just going to say <laughs> Minneapolis. That's so funny. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. and they were kind of like wearing these grunge clothes that didn't fit them, right? They seem totally, totally kind of separated like, out from the movie. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, whatever. It was fine. Yeah, it was yeah. fine. And, uh, but the concert scenes, like, oh, that looked like a lot of fun. Yeah, I was yeah. like, I wish I was there. Yeah. I wish that was my 20s. Yeah. My early 20s. So we had a taste of that in San Jose. We didn't have like they did, did in yeah. Seattle, but we had like, there was a band called Shovelhead. There was a band called Pieces of Lisa. Uh, there was a band called, um, well, there's my band, which was trying to, yeah. <laughs> trying to be 
part of it. Um, but there were some, you know, it was grunge. We were playing grunge music. And, well, I um, had, yeah. And it was fun. Yeah. It, it carried over to like when I was young, like a young college student, though, mm. like some of that culture. The music wasn't the same, but yeah. like, you know, the scene mm-hmm. was very similar, mm-hmm. except that they were playing this Limkit Biscuit kind of shit. Yeah, so we yeah. saw the movie recently. Um, Have we not talked about this? No, yet? I don't think we talked Woodstock about this. Woodstock '99. Is that the name of the yeah, movie? Yeah, we did not talk about this. No, we didn't. That's crazy that we didn't. Because that to me is the ultimate millennial movie. That is the ultimate millennial movie. And there's a band in there mm-hmm. called Bush. Yeah. Who the tail end of the grunge? Who were the yeah. tail end of the grunge <laughs> thing? And by by the time Bush came along, I was like, nah, no. Yeah. There's another band called them. Um, it's sad if you think about it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, then things carried over to this. Yeah. I never listened to Slipknot. Uh-huh. I did listen to Limp Biscuit. I never right. bought their album, but like my band played um, Nookie. Right. And it was always fun to play. Listen, I was watching that and I was like, I have never listened to any of these bands. Mm. And I re- and I was looking at the crowd and it dawned on me. I didn't listen to this music because I wasn't white, you mm, know, because mm. I was like that. They, it was a sea of white kids. Yeah, it's true. And, and that, <laughs> I don't I can't believe nobody said that because yeah, like yeah, yeah. nobody actually comes out and well, says nobody this. thought about that. Yeah, back nobody then. thought like, about like, it. That was the thing like in the, in the 90s and in the early 2000s. Nobody thought about the idea of this being white. Yeah, it was just default yeah. American culture. Right? right. And I was looking at this sea of fra- American like. Frat white dudes. frat yeah. dudes and the girls and girls and i was like wait why don't i was not part of this i was not invited to that i not that i wanted to be part mm-hmm. of it but i was like this is a completely but i vaguely remember how like that was what 2004 no that was 1999 oh 99 you're Woodstock, right okay 99. yeah so yeah. That, all right of course Okay, so that's transitioning right into the yeah, millennial period. Yeah, and I was 16 in yep. 99, so I would have been, like, if I were white, mm-hmm. <laughs> I would have been there, you know? But, like, you were listening to well, what? Well, Japanese pop, because I was in Japan. But you were listening to pop music. I was totally also. listening yeah. to pop music. Like, I was what were you listening to? Well, I, in 99... Weirdly, this is a really strange um, story, but Japan was stuck in, like... 70s rock mm. in 1999 hmm. and when i went to japan everybody was obsessed with 70s rock okay so i was like rediscovering well discovering because i wasn't alive yeah. in the 70s david bowie queen mm, like mm, all that mm. the glam bands yeah. i was really into that because 99 in japan they were they were really into these glam rock that makes total sense of yeah course. and they never moved on from yeah. the- <laughs> Interesting. But also they um the hip hop, the Japanese hip hop rock scene what well, mm-hmm. the hip hop scene was like there was a rock fusion mm-hmm. hip hop thing going on. And so they were definitely listening to Red Hot Chili Peppers, mm-hmm. um yeah. and the like. So Red Hot yeah. Chili Peppers was another nineties thing. Yes. And I think that continued into the two thousands. By then I didn't listen to yeah. them anymore. Um because Anthony Kiedis started singing. Mm-hmm. And he can't sing. <laughs> he can't sing at all. Like we saw it in the documentary yeah, yeah. and he was horrible. Yeah. <laughs> And Flea buck naked. Yeah. yeah, Flea was like completely naked. Yeah, completely naked. <laughs> with his penis. But there was like the time, dangling. that was the time, it was still before cell phones. Yeah, yeah. Before so that's phones. why that kind of debauchery was yeah. possible. Exactly. Like, let's say you were at that rave with uh, Fat Boy Slim and you had sex against the stage, right? Yeah, right. Then nobody would have caught that on their cell phone. Right. So you could have gotten away with it. Right. And, and there, you could there be were a soccer mom by now. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, but I, I, I think I said the thing that like the people who were at the Woodstock 99 Mm -hmm. grew up later Mm -hmm. to maybe be the people who went to the... Oh, who stormed the Capitol. Who stormed the Capitol. Totally. It's it's the same energy. Yeah, it's the same. But that, you know, I and I am not, please don't Mm -hmm. cancel me. Not that I'm cancelable. Yeah. But I'm not trying to make excuses. But I think if you watch that Woodstock 99 documentary, mm-hmm. the frustration is mm-hmm. that the powers that be mm-hmm. are denying them food and water. Yeah. And they're strangely... So they they were like anarchists. They were like left. I mean, it, it will evoke something, definitely evoke something primal in you if you deny yeah. a group of people food and water. And when you're 20 years old, oh, yeah. you're a liberal yeah. left 
extreme anarchist, mm-hmm. you know, kind of, you know, maybe Marxist kind mm-hmm. of attitude. But then when you become mm-hmm. 20 years later, yeah, when totally. you're working yeah, and you're yeah. working on your blue collar job or whatever, right. you're the same person back then with the same angst, mm-hmm. but you're no longer a Marxist leftist anarchist. Mm-hmm. You're a Trump supporter. Yeah. It's the anger. It's not right. the, it's not the political party. Right. I don't know that people might hate me for saying that, but, but I, but I mean, it, who it cares? Taps into it's the not, idea of, not, of the power of the yeah, state. Yeah, exactly. Against you. You're not making a statement, so you know. Yeah, it's just it, I was just making it's a an connection. observation. Yeah, it's that, a con- that the it's kids a then, the twenty year olds then, become the forty year olds who might do that. Kind oh, of totally. Thing. I mean, they left the documentary apparently left out this part where they were chanting the lyrics of "Killing in the Name of." Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and breaking apart <laughs> yeah the like all the the structure mm-hmm. of the destroying the, shit yeah destroying shit and i was like well i understand and there was a lot to be mad about back then there was yeah and I there's mean, a lot to be mad about today except today, that it's yeah. it's placed into these weird mediated media driven yes. kind of categories yes. of things yes sides and you, you know you kind of you can scream at people on TikTok now. Yeah, right. You don't have to break shit. Exactly. Yeah. So the catharsis comes in the media sphere. Mm. Yeah. I mean, people are out in the street, but... But in that sense, I think with this movie, c- coming back to this movie... Different time. Different time. But I feel like there's this nostalgia that I have towards the 90s that is just growing. And I, and I think it's because it was the last time where... We didn't have this seemingly like like an abundance of technology that mm-hmm. feels unnecessary, that like it's doing more yeah. harm than good. Like I feel like an answering machine was enough. Exactly, because <laughs> now we're all monitored constantly. Yeah. It's like this virtue monitoring I'm that's just going like, on. Do we really have to be this connected? Like, you know, can, couldn't we have just stopped at like AOL chat rooms? Totally. Like, <laughs> yeah. We didn't need to carry this shit around in our pocket yeah. every day. I'm like, I remember like, you know, you had to like, I don't know, you can't use the phone while you're using the internet and so mm-hmm. you know you had to like actually dial a number to oh, yeah. connect it yeah and then you like go on a chat room and then yep. there's a limited time where you can do this because people need to use the phone right yeah and the modem cost money and it's a it's very expensive yeah. so i feel like that's enough internet time yeah totally mm-hmm. uh, yeah like give yourself 20 minutes a day check yeah. your email check yeah. the sports scores and then you're done you know remember how exciting it was to get an email oh, yeah. from oh, someone yeah. Oh, yeah. oh yeah it's an email from vince what's he <laughs> saying <laughs> vince my friend vince tried to get me on aol chat yeah. stuff and it was like this explosion of windows on my screen and i was uh, like ah, fuck this get me out of here and well, i never did it again i remember being on aol chat rooms like and it was so exciting because oh God, it's I, like, I got day. to talk to people who lived you know in different countries and stuff yeah and i was like chatting with strangers i didn't get deep into it because mm-hmm. i had a life but mm-hmm. um you know i'm like talked to supposedly they were men or boys my yeah age. that was the yeah. thing it's like you never knew yeah but then back then catfishing wasn't like that yeah it wasn't it wasn't yeah. there yet i think people you know they might have looked a little different from their photos but they were still right. like who they were you know who they yeah i think they pretty were. early on though there were some people faking it yeah yeah, yeah. Movies about music. You know what I found interesting with this Mm -hmm. subject in this movie? Mm -hmm. I had forgotten how much, and this is really well represented, we read newspapers and magazines and books. Yeah. Yeah. And you were all, everybody had a book on there next to them. Totally. And you were often reading something like, again, like Ken Kesey or uh, Tom Robbins or Sartre or mm-hmm. Ayn Rand <laughs> or, you know, so you, it kind of defined who you are and your buddy would tell you this book is good and stuff like that. Um, Confederacy of Dunces, right. um, these kind of books, Carlos Castaneda, you know, stuff like that. So there was this, everybody was defining themselves by the book they read and you would mm-hmm. see them reading a book but then magazines like rolling stone spin oh, magazine I loved magazines um all of these like fashion magazines everybody would leaf through the fashion magazine periodicals was a big thing mm-hmm. so in the bay area we had bam b-a-m bay area music mm-hmm. and that's where you'd leaf through and see what the local musicians were doing mm-hmm. where they're playing and so you know th- this was shown in the seattle versions mm-hmm. obviously they're looking through the paper and there's the scene with pearl jam when they do a review of the show mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like just this really negative review. Um, I think it, the funniest line was um, the lead singer should move to a city like Los Angeles and New yeah. York where he wouldn't stand out. Where he would disappear. Yeah, something would, he like would, that. his mediocre talent would disappear yeah. in the crowd. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> and Eddie Vedder is kind of looking at him like. Rrr. It was interesting to see all that stuff was really accurate. The fashion, yeah. The, yeah. The, the the periodicals, the books. Yeah, and the it music. was it was it was also it was really interesting to see these famous people at the peak of their game mm. like at the the height of their game you know yeah. because for me like you know i don't really remember eddie vetter looking like that because he was he was a kid like he had just joined the band i, I think, know right point. like I, for me i i kind of remember him as like maybe early 30s you know like, yeah, like right. that, that's like my dominant yeah like, yeah whatever but he he was so young yeah he looked so young i think 10 came out in 91 the album 10 mm-hmm. it was either 90 it was 91 i think mm-hmm. so this is they're making that the film right when mm-hmm. that album came out and they dragged him up from los angeles he yeah. was a surfer in la and every um like i remember if you read any just teen romance novel from the 90s mm-hmm. somebody's going to a pearl jam concert okay <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, oh, I got tickets to the Pearl Jam. Everybody is going to the Pearl Jam concert Mm -hmm. in any 90s. Um, novel. Yeah. Because it, they were that popular. They were that Oh, yeah. Universal. I saw them. Yeah. I, I saw them. I yeah. saw Soundgarden. Yeah. So that was very interesting. Yeah. What else? Well, I want to get around to this. I want to get around to your thoughts on Bridget Fonda. Okay. So I get the feeling that she's not your favorite actress. Well, okay. This I have no problem with Bridget Fonda, but I don't find her particularly attractive. I find her very plain, mm-hmm. but I feel like in a lot of movies, she plays these parts where we as an audience are kind of we have to think of her as a very hot, like desirable woman. Mm. She plays a lot of roles like this. But then in this movie, she kind of won me over because I really uh, liked this character. Yeah, she's and a great character. She's the best character yeah, in the movie. Yeah, f- it really fit her. Mm-hmm. And the clothes and everything really, you know, mm-hmm. I, I liked it. Um, so I get it now. Yeah. But I always felt as though she was a plain Jodie Foster. Oh, okay. Yeah. I always really liked her. I thought she was really cute. She has this kind of upturned nose. That's now adorable. I, I see it, yeah. And she has, you can tell she's practiced her smile, mm-hmm. but still it's kind of a winning smile. Mm-hmm. Um, and she was just, yeah, really cute, like a cute normal girl. Yeah, she's girl. cute normal, yeah. And she was really big at this at this. Yeah, yeah. stage of Well, things. I see it, but I think back in the 90s when I was a teenage girl, mm. I aspired to be like a Britney really Spears. hot woman. Okay. And I'm talking about like a bad girl, like, you know, okay. like Angelina Jolie. But okay. particularly, I'm thinking about Drew Barrymore. I love... Right. 90s Drew Barrymore right. where she was just like you know yeah she looked great then fucking flashing people mm-hmm. and like you know well that that David Letterman yeah, and incident she was, was like her at her peak yeah. yeah and she was also cute she yeah, kind of has great. a little girl thing going mm-hmm. on but also she was a king badass with heaps of eyeliner on yeah. and like and I was really into that like mm-hmm. the dark lipstick and or ethereal just really beautiful Mm. women like Liv Tyler okay you know so I you know compared to that my 90s ideals Mm -hmm. Liv Tyler Alicia Silverstone Mm -hmm. Drew Barrymore Bridget John Bridget Fonda is a little plain yeah so it's interesting though um because again we've been talking about this idea that in in this early 90s period I Mm -hmm. think there was because we'd been so overwhelmed by this just gobs and gobs of hairspray yeah yeah during the 80s and bleach Uh and long hair and like um this macho shit Mm -hmm. that if we didn't like you know the band helix or we didn't like motley Crue, yeah you know people would call us a faggot Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know it wasn't a it wasn't obviously didn't carry the weight that that word carries mm-hmm, now, mm-hmm. but you know this was the attitude, and yeah. and people like me mm-hmm. who liked artistic music mm-hmm. and um, simple things, mm-hmm. and you know like kind of a sense of, of groundedness and authenticity and something real, you know mm-hmm. that all of this music and all of this fashion of the eighties by the time of the late eighties, oh my god, it was so terrible. So then along comes you know like first for me Winona Ryder, like yeah, yeah, she's. Gorgeous, yeah. but she's she could be you know the girl next door. Yeah, and I think Bridget Fonda kind of falls into that. She was you know she was not blonde. She's mm-hmm. brunette. She's cute, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and you wanted the cute girl. Mm-hmm. You didn't want the um, sexy blonde girl. You mm-hmm. wanted the cute girl at that time. You know, yeah. a girl who would be down yeah, to earth. I get it. Yeah. yeah. I totally get it. So, and, and I, but I think it was a brief period. I think it was like, again, that kind of 80, 
89 to 95 period where that was happening. I guess for like a bi-curious teenage girl uh-huh. that I was, yeah. I was like, yeah, okay, I can see you that. Know, yeah. I wanted a woman. Like I, yeah. I either wanted to be one of them mm-hmm, mm-hmm. or I wanted to, I don't know, I wanted to be in the proximity of someone like Angelina Jolie. I, you know, mm-hmm. it, there was this like, you know, like, yeah, this womanness that I'm missing I in Bridget Pond. But now, right. now when I see her, I'm like, okay, mm-hmm, I get it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. She's adorable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this character was amazing. Yeah, she was great. Yeah. And I think you and I felt the same thing. Mm-hmm. Kind of wish we didn't have that last scene. I know, because she goes, spoiler alert, she goes back to this Matt Dillon character who's an indie, who's a mediocre indie musician, mm-hmm. uh, grunge singer, musician, yep. singer. And there was this part where she um, tries to get a breast augmentation yeah. because Matt Dillon's character is obviously into like big boobs. Because he's got pictures of yeah. naked women with boobs all across his wall (laughs) and then um she goes to the doctor's to the doctor's office and the doctor is bill pullman yeah played by bill pullman and he tells her like listen i never say this to any of my patients but you you're perfect you don't need this procedure and he kind of hits on her yeah he does he's interested but in in that very shy kind of yeah it was it was not a creepy like at all and he was very age percent creepy yeah but he was percent creepy for me like as a woman i would say bill pullman is not creepy like back then you know, yeah, yeah. and it was not, it wasn't age inappropriate or anything. It was just like, you yeah. know, two adults, like whatever. Right. And I was, I think I said to you like, oh my God, marry the plastic surgeon. Forget about the indie musician. You'll thank me later is <laughs> what you said. You'll thank me later because the joke that I tell. Meanwhile, you ended up with the <laughs> well, Matt Dillon character. Well, I was listening to that podcast that I mentioned earlier and Kim France was saying, mm-hmm. you know what I flaked out on? I just totally flaked on marrying a rich dude because mm-hmm. i was too busy <laughs> dating these indie rockers yeah, i think you told me about and that i was like bit. oh my god me too <laughs> because when i was in college there were girls who were like they were pursuing doctors mm-hmm. and bankers mm-hmm. and now they're all like very comfortable yeah and i'm like oh why did i flake out on that but i know why i did because you are attracted to what you're attracted yeah, to. yeah and I, I i couldn't live with a banker or a mm-hmm. plastic surgeon mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. at all mm-hmm. and i know this but it's it's good to i like joking about it yeah 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 but yeah so she was one of those people she's gonna figure her shit out she's gonna yeah. go to architecture school mm-hmm. and, and he's he's gonna be gone yeah. she wanted somebody to um say bless you mm-hmm. when she sneezes mm-hmm. yeah and then hats off to bridget fonda she pulls off a masterful sneeze totally and then he says bless you and then that's the end of the movie they sort of look at each other and then they kiss i don't know i could have done without that scene i thought she was going to go off to architecture school well maybe she does later yeah it doesn't have to you know stories don't end when you're 23 true True. obviously in your case like a lot of stuff happened yeah yeah you were 23 (laughs) that's absolutely true and we were also saying like because they're also playing games with each other all these people like yeah so the uh the mm -hmm. the romance games were interesting from 1992 and then at some point you were like why didn't we play games like this and i was like because you were 50 years old when we. (laughs) (laughs) yeah i've never had any game though I could see that, yeah. <laughs> yep, never had any game. Just kind of waited until somebody picked me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I do want to talk a little bit more about the music because... Yes. So it features Soundgarden, Alice in Chains, Pearl Jam, obviously, but not performances, um, mm-hmm. but as actors. And they've got songs in the soundtrack. So I bought the soundtrack. Mm, and the soundtrack... Okay. I would listen to all the time because this wasn't like throwaway songs. Like oh, Pearl Jam yeah, gave yeah. two of their best mm-hmm. songs that never ended up on any albums. Mm-hmm. Uh, one was called Breathe and the other was State of Love and Trust. Mm-hmm. And then Chris Cornell did this great solo acoustic song called Seasons. Yeah. And uh, you've got Mother Love Bone, that probably their best song. You've got Screaming Trees, mm-hmm. uh, which was a great song. That one hit also, I think, because of this movie. Um, not sure if Mud Honey was on there, but it's interesting they, that they got... Um, oh, they also had Smashing Pumpkins, who wasn't mm-hmm. from from Seattle. They were from Chicago. But they had that song that I played you called Drown, which mm-hmm. is this... When I was 22, 23 years old, this song Drown just completely spoke to my mm-hmm. the depths of my soul. Mm-hmm. But what's interesting is they got someone named Paul Westerberg mm-hmm. to do most of the music in the movie. Mm-hmm. And he was from a band called The Replacements. Okay. And The Replacements were a good band. 
but they were not grunge. Mm-hmm. Um, they were an, like an alt. They were a punk alt, alternative punk mm-hmm. band, and they were good. They were notoriously drunk. Mm-hmm. By this time, they had broken up. Paul Westerberg is from Minneapolis. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's really weird. Like, why did they get Paul Westerberg to do this? The Replacements was Winona Ryder's favorite band. Oh. Yeah, back in the Winona and Johnny Depp days. Mm-hmm. But yeah, there's also a lot of references to bands like um, the Smithereens. And mm. and it, I thought it funny that Campbell Scott was always wearing one of these shirts mm-hmm. from all of these hip kind of grunge bands. Mm-hmm. But yeah. again, it didn't, it didn't fit. Like he was wearing it like a... A Love Company shirt. He was wearing a Mud Honey shirt. He was wearing a Sub Bop shirt, uh-huh. and it just didn't. Yeah, all the while looking like a complete Midwestern. looking like a corporate. Yeah, dude. yeah. <laughs> I, I think maybe the idea that they were trying to get with that is that even like you had your job in the corporation in a company, but at night you went out. I believe that. And yeah. you were if you like were a like clubber. yeah in yeah. this in Seattle back then. Yeah, I totally right. believe. Yeah. Well, because why not? Why wouldn't you? Are you crazy? To yeah. Not? And I was working. You know, I was working for a high tech company in Silicon Valley. Um, much later, but you know, things were. This is when things were not formal anymore. You know, you didn't have to wear a nice shirt to work. You wore t shirts to work. Well, you know, like in Japan, I, I saw this thing. It was about like something else. It didn't involve. What I'm about to talk about. But, you know, there are a lot of people who go work at these stuffy offices and at night they dress like Pikachu. Like literally, like it's it's not even like they, Pikachu? Uh, a Pokemon character. Oh. But, you know, like and, and men who dress like Sailor Moon on the weekends. I don't know what Sailor Moon is. It's, it's also an anime character. It's a, okay. you know, female am, anime uh, character. Uh-huh. But these people tend to work like as accountants or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then that's kind of their release so maybe if you have a job like that you might need it more Mm -hmm. you know i think it was just that the scene was so rich and it was undefined yeah yeah exactly Uh, and i totally believe it wasn't typed yet like again heavy metal was big or Mm -hmm. you were listening to cheesy pop Mm -hmm. but here was this like raw local music yeah and like why wouldn't you be part of it kind of thing yeah right yeah and you could also be pretty passionate about it yeah as a fan yeah you you don't have to like play the guitar yourself or right i get that Mm -hmm. i i wish i i was passionate about something it was a great it was uh, and i'm i'm sorry i'm being nostalgic but it really was a great time yeah and i I think we knew it was a great time yeah yeah it was it was so much fun yeah I to be 23 that. years old mm-hmm. in 1992. Yeah, I'm jealous. We didn't. We did this whole podcast without mentioning Nirvana because it had nothing to do with. I mean, it had obviously had something to do with, with Nirvana, but it didn't mention. Can Nirvana. I share my Nirvana story? Yes, so I was talking please. about um about how I'd heard Jane's Addiction first, mm-hmm. and then I heard Smashing Pumpkins, <laughs> mm-hmm. and then I heard Alice in Chains. Mm-hmm. And it was like, wow, music is getting really cool. There was also like a lot of British music happening like the cure was still oh, big yeah and you had like the lightning seeds and like you had midnight oil uh, from australia Sinead o'connor there were a lot of women it was just such an incredible time but then i was at the dorm room mm-hmm. it's in my friend brian's dorm and we were hanging out mm-hmm. drinking beer and on mtv they had this world premiere of a band called nirvana mm-hmm. and it was smells like teen spirit mm-hmm. and we all stopped what we were doing. I mean, first of all, if there's a world premiere video, mm-hmm. you'd pay attention. You're right. But we all were like, holy fucking shit. Those first four chords. Yeah. But then it's when the drums yes. kick in. Yeah. And it was and then it came back down again. Yeah, it was crazy. It was like this simple strum and then this huge sound. Yeah. And then it came back down again. Yeah. It wasn't this monotonous heavy metal yeah. hairband shit. I know what you mean. And it was like, oh my God, what yeah. is this? My mind was blown too. Yeah. yeah. And when so I first heard that and it was so cool doing that in the dorm with my I new bet. friends yeah, when yeah. I was in college. Yeah, yeah, I bet. And we're like, whoa, yeah. this is amazing. Yeah. And then it was also when Red Hot Chili Peppers, Blood Sugar, Sex Magic was out. It was just uh, it's just such a good time. Yeah, I bet. Because I, I heard it for the first time, not back then, mm-hmm. but like around the time he died. Mm-hmm. Because I I missed that whole thing and I didn't know who he was and then it was on the news and whatever. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden it was on the radio again, like nonstop. And so that's when I heard it. Yeah, I do remember where I was when he died. Mm -hmm. So yeah, great time. Mm -hmm. Decent movie. Yeah, It's a little capsule of an era. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Of music and dating. In mm-hmm. a place. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. In a place, yeah. Um, so are we going to continue with movies about music or are we going to move on to... Movies about movies places? Movies about places or movies about whatever. Yeah, I think we're going to... Are we going to retitle it Movies About? Yeah, I think it's okay. time to move on. So you've already yeah. got a, a, a new theme song you're yeah, developing. Yeah, I need to record it. Yeah, we can mm-hmm. do that. 
right. And then I need to come up with a new uh, graphic. Oh, well, that's Because fun. we can't have mu- movies about music. True. Graphic anymore. True. So, so I don't know. We may um, yeah, take some time transitioning to that. Cause I, or I don't know. I don't s- think it'll take time. No, it won't take time. Yeah, I think it's not working. Like we yeah. need to make a mission statement. Yeah, and also like we're also in a really good place right now in terms of workflow. Like you're working, but not when you're not drowning in work, and I'm for once not drowning in work, and I'm just you know sort. Yeah, of, I'm finally making some money, which is yeah, nice. and I'm finally having some free time yeah it is a good time right now um and we also i think we have a dog now yeah i guess we've decided to, yeah we recorded a little song about her tonight. yeah <laughs> maybe we'll share that with you at yeah. another time. and so it's you know it's it's a really good flow mm-hmm. i think for us and so yeah. but yeah let us know what kind of topics or what movies that's a good idea that's yeah, a good yeah. call out yeah, yeah, on the comments, we still have our Instagram, um, at Movies About Music. Yeah, I've neglected the YouTube channel, but I'll, I'll pick right. it back up again. Yeah, and so please leave a comment about, you know, what movies you would like us to cover. You yeah, know, yeah. maybe we, there's something that we haven't... And it doesn't have to be about music. I think we're going right. to start with... so it's with, Movies About, and we're going to take yeah. certain subject matters. Certain we're, sub- we're, yeah. We are going to keep doing Movies About Music. Mm-hmm. It's just that we're going to expand it into other... Yeah, and so, for example, like a movie about a certain place movies mm-hmm. about food was one of the yeah yeah, yeah we talked about we talked about movies about movies yeah 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 maybe we'll get highbrow movies about mm-hmm. dystopia i don't know yeah yeah maybe yeah i mean who knows yeah yeah but yeah just let us know and uh please leave a review and subscribe yes please to do. the youtube channel and maybe follow us on instagram and subscribe um, yeah. to the app the podcast I yeah guess. That would be that would be lovely. Yeah, and we have like I think some announcements to make. Like you know, we're doing a benefit concert for a dog rescue mm, yeah. in October. So mm-hmm. stay tuned for information regarding that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Things are good. Mm-hmm. So we're getting ourselves out of this fearsome period of time. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Fearful. I think that, yeah. Fearful. Fearsome. Fearful. Um. Even, you know, Anxiety although- inducing. Yeah, although I still have massive anxiety about loads of stuff. Yeah, but you don't. You're yeah. not as anxious as you were before. I'm not. Yeah. Also, walking the dog. Yeah, we we at walk five thirty in the morning. Five thirty like to six in the morning. Four to five hours. Yeah. of dog walking, <laughs> running. No, I would say two to three hours well, every day. Well, like you take her out for an hour, mm-hmm. I take her out for an hour and a half, and then yeah, probably at the end of the day, I take her out for 40 minutes that's right that's a lot of dog lot walking, of walking because i i also go over an hour often yeah all right well no wonder she's tired even though she's a border collie <laughs> yeah all right all right take care everybody take care bye-bye under the moonlight i'll sing you a song so you'd magically feel a lot less alone If we paint ourselves all bright with stories Of heroes and poets and sadness and war Of immeasurable pain, unconditional love Movies about